As developers and technologists, it's easy to think that powerful and unique ideas will percolate to the top. If we build something amazing, enthusiastic users will find and share our creations. Sometimes this happens, but more often, success is an iceberg on so many levels. We're going to look at one of those icebergs on this episode. Join me and Christian Medina as we discuss SEO, search engine optimization, for developers. Some of your search rankings are out of your control. But as you'll see, there are many tools in the developer's toolbox that directly affect your search rank. Let's dive in. This is Talk Python to Me, episode 263, recorded April 23rd, 2020. Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python, the language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode is sponsored by Kite and Linode. Please check out what they're offering during their segments. It really helps support the show. Chris, welcome back to Talk Python to Me. Hi, Mike. How's it going? Glad to be here. Yeah, it's going really well. You and I, we were supposed to be catching up at PyCon, and we're not, actually. That's right. That's right. We had uh, some interesting plans for PyCon this year, and we were unable to do that. But oh well. We uh, roll with the punches and move on, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, what a bummer. I'm, I'm a little bit bummed that PyCon's not happening this year. But at the same time, you know, it's first world problems, right? Like, everything could be way worse than we don't get to go to our geek holiday. Sure. But at the same time... I really was looking forward to it, and uh, yeah, we had some cool stuff for the expo floor we were going to do together, but not to be, maybe maybe 2021. That's right. I tweeted a little picture of all the badges and stuff. I know. I had uh, I was going to bring <laughs> online, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I have a big box of uh, stickers that we'll now have to wait till the next event. So, yep. yeah, welcome back. Welcome back. You've been on the show a couple of times. You first came on the show with episode 166 for continuous delivery with Python, and that was really interesting to talk about continuous delivery, but it was also one of the shows that just had so many little tips and tools and techniques that was like, so many right. people wrote in and talked about it. It was like, it was awesome. And it was like, it was awesome, even if you don't care about CICD. So that was, that was fun. And then you came back and we talked about Python packaging and the options that you explored there. Yep. Well, what I'm wondering though, is if somebody went to the internet and they did a search for those things, would my site come up? <laughs> I could tell you mine won't. <laughs> yeah, I've been reading a lot about what makes all of that work. So in running the, the stuff I do at Try Except Pass, it's been interesting trying to understand how the internet actually works. You think you know how it works, but you don't. You think you actually have control over what you see and how you get to it, but you also don't. <laughs> So yeah. um, it turns out that a lot of that is filtered through a bunch of companies, and those tend to be mostly Google, but Bing plays a little role in it as well. So that's why, you know, if you've ever had the, the situation where, like, you're talking to a buddy and you Googled something and you're like, why didn't you find it? I Googled it and it's right here. And yeah. Then your buddy Googles it and the search results are completely different. There's a lot of stuff that happens in that algorithm that really has an effect on how well your pages show up on search results. Well, I think that that's a, a good indicator or data point for just how much the algorithms are playing a role here, right? Like if I go and search for something when I'm logged in, I get different results than if I search when I'm not logged in. And anytime I want that's to try right. to assess how is this thing actually ranking for the world like how is it really being relevant to others i go and open an incognito or private window and do my search there because there's a lot of different things at play right there are a lot and so for example like i have like i don't log in like in my work account isn't tied at all to my home stuff um the results are completely different when i'm at work and do google searches and so it's interesting because, you know, one of the main reasons the internet is what it is, is like this freedom where everybody can post information and make it available to the whole world. But actually, it turns out there's all these gatekeepers that have come up in recent years, and it's all based on all the search algorithm and all the search engine rankings. Yeah, everything is free, and there's like this abundance of information. But when there's too much of an abundance then it's not providing the information or the actual information itself that's valuable. It's the 
the filtering and the grouping and the directing you through and just mostly get rid of all the stuff that's not there, right? Like, okay, what do I actually care about when I'm saying, like, I need to learn this thing in Python or I want to read something about this news event, right? It's not that's that right. it's trying to show it all to me. The actual role is to, like, not show me the stuff. Like, show me only what matters, which I think is a, it's a little bit contradictory to the way the internet started, right? Like, it started out with, yep. like, I don't know. I think of Yahoo as, like, the most prototypical early, early, early days where it was literally a directory, like a directory, the yellow pages yeah. of the internet, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so crazy. It's all been kind of like incremental steps on how to make it easier for you to find stuff, but also how does the search engine determine what is a valid result for you? But, you know, by them doing that, that means they have applied a filter on all of the websites in the world, right, in order to do this. And if you're just lonely old guy that wrote something that you just want to make it out, publish it out there, people finding it is not as easy as uh, it sounds. Just publishing something on the internet these days is not enough. Yeah, it's not a field of dreams. That's right. Build it and they will come sort of thing, right? So uh, maybe let's take a real short step backwards and talk a little bit about Try Accept Pass, what you're doing there, what you're trying to grow there, and whatnot, just to give people a sense of like, why are you studying these things? What are you trying to do? Uh, sure, sure. So, so I started Triaccept Pass almost five years ago now, which is kind of crazy. That's insane, right? As a medium blog, right? And so then I, I had the domain name, the triacceptpass.org, and then, you know, I, I wanted to get off the platform and start building my own thing. So I have a, you know, it's website, there's a collection of articles about how to build real world software, problems you run into with uh, engineering and, and stuff like that. And now we have a podcast on top of it, right? Yeah, your podcast is pretty new, right? You've got like six, seven episodes. We're up to episode eight okay. this week. Yeah, yeah. Right I'm going to be putting them out more regularly now. But uh, yeah, so based on, on that, I really wanted to go hard on trying to get more visitors last year. And I started to read about what I needed to do in order to make that happen. And I have discovered all this stuff that... I thought about SEO as uh, SEO meaning search engine optimization, right? Because we technically haven't defined the term. So when people talk about how to make your website visible in a search engine, they're talking about optimizing it so that it shows up appropriately, right? So I had traditionally thought about this being more kind of like a keyword thing that maybe marketing does or sales or somebody else does for a large company website, but I, I had <laughs> yeah, realized... Yeah, the site works. I wrote it for you. Now it's up that's to right, you. That's right. Your turn. To, to like get you, it, go, you get it right? to rank, baby. Yeah. Fill in the fields and you're done, right? But it doesn't <laughs> work that way. It turns out you need a bunch of hooks in there in order for it to actually be picked up appropriately by the search engine algorithms. And I'm not just talking about the traditional, like, there's always been these, like, robots.txt files or sitemaps, XMLs that help search engines a little bit. But it's uh, way, way deeper than that with uh, a bunch of meta tags and, uh, you know, formatting and, and a bunch of stuff that we'll get into in a minute. Right. And, you know, performance is playing a much more significant role in SEO than it has traditionally. That's right. And one of the main things is that because uh, mobile is such a big thing, then performance has become a lot more important. Like, it's always been important because the better performance you have, the more global access your website gets because internet is not the best everywhere in the world. But um, with mobile, that has become more of an issue because not everybody has like the fancy high-speed phones, right? So right. it turns out that a lot of how your website is ranked is tied to that. Yeah. yeah. So I'm looking forward to talking about all of these things. I just kind of want to put it out there at the beginning, though. I feel like that it's so easy to fall into the trap of well, a little bit of like, if you build it, they will come, right? Like if I build something cool, people will eventually find it and it will rise to the top. If I build some amazing site, some service, some product, whatever, I want people to come check it out. If it has merit, people will come and love it. And, you know, stuff like this, as you know, the SEO, as well as like the other sides of marketing and just getting the word out, right? It's so tricky and vague. That's but right. it is actually what you have to do to make that succeed, especially in a world of abundance like we are now. Yeah. So building great content is just like step one. However, there is still an aspect of if you build it, they will come because if you built something that's fantastic that everybody wants to read, then more web pages will link to it. And that also has an implication in your rankings as well. Yeah. But yeah. I'm sure you probably don't have any insight to this answer and I'm just speculating, but 
you know, Google is built on PageRank, which is sort of how many pages refer back to a given page. In yeah. the super early days, that was like the primary link. And the people would go do stupid stuff like they would buy links on other domains, like just pages yeah. of links or other really shady, stupid stuff. I wonder at some point, though, when is like machine learning going to be the thing that decides, right? When is it going to be just like, well, there's a deep neural net. It already is. Yeah, you think so? Oh, it's big time. So that's why, that's why Google is pretty much an AI company. That's what they have, right? Mach uh, yeah. Vast amounts of machine learning to try to parse. I mean, these things are reading the content of your web pages to decide how to rank it. It's not just about links. It's about the structure, the grammar, how many images you have, how well the images are formatted, how it flows, all that. All that's all machine learning. Wow, okay. It's crazy. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I didn't realize this was so advanced. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always kind of knew, but I didn't expect it to be this. This advanced. Yeah. Well, there's so much money behind it, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. In terms of advertising, right? It's one of the most valuable companies in the world. And that's basically makes them an advertising company. And, but the yeah, ads and, are around like this kind of stuff. So I, I can see, I guess so, why there's so much effort. And the other interesting part is, right, that ranking algorithm, the SEO algorithm that Google uses, generates entire industry. There's people that exist around how that algorithm works. And Google doesn't tell you how it works. It kind of gives you clues here and there. But what happens sometimes is they update it. And so then there's people that have been sitting at the top of the first page of your 10 results off of Google and all of a sudden become number 100. And there's <laughs> like real economic consequences out of that, especially yeah. for, for like blogging community, the people that live off of uh, content that they produce in smaller websites kind of thing. They're always on top of that. Right. So let's start with defining a couple of terms that you sure. have here. One is uh, domain rank and one is page rank. Yeah. So we've been talking about ranking a little bit. So what happens is each page in your website gets ranked and there's a lot of things that come into that. And it's like you get a grade, right? And the higher the grade, the better. From the tidbits of information I've been able to gather here and there, we just kind of talked a little bit about it. It's the, the content matters. How many words in the page matter, grammar, how uh, performance, we'll get into that later. The links from external websites that are linking to your page and the links from your page that are going to external websites. Not just how many, but like what specifically, how that hierarchy is set up matters, right? And so that gives okay. you a grade, right? And so then to your page, but there's also a grade to your domain. So like I have tracks that pass ORG. And that has a rank, and that rank might, I just checked just a little bit ago, that rank was in the 30s, 33 or something like that, which is, I'm actually happy about that, which is not <laughs> a great rank, but it's, it's good because I started in the 20s, but it took me a year to get to 33, right? Yeah, where do you check this rank? Uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of tools that do this. So, so aside from Google having their own little internal search engine ranking stuff, there's entire companies that do this. And uh, so I use Moz.com, but there's also Alexa. I've seen some of those. They have some, some free accounts you can get with them that gives you some, some extra information, on, allows you to do some searching and limits how many searches you can do. But you can also, you know, if you get like a full-blown account, you can like get into like nitty-gritty details. But those guys keep their own thing too, right? They give you a ranking, but it's not the ranking that Google's giving you. It's just an approximation of what we think Google will be giving you. And really, really the key player is Google. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I mean, there are other search engines, but they're pretty safe to just ignore them, right? I mean, there's Bing. Yeah, Bing still gets a little bit. Yeah, but, and there, there's but uh, DuckDuckGo, right? Yeah, actually, I've been using Duck, DuckDuckGo for six plus months now as my primary search engine. Yeah. Okay, how's that experience been? Yeah. It's been working nicely. I like it. And they got very, very similar tools to what you get out of Google search. But, you know, they're, you know, they're still building up their stuff, so... Uh, Every once in a while, you still got to do the Google search. I don't know. I've wanted to use DuckDuckGo, and I very much support the privacy side of things. Like, I would right. prefer to <laughs> give less to Google, although I don't hate, hate them. I think they offer a lot of great services, but I'm like a big fan sure. of using Firefox over Chrome, for example. And DuckDuckGo seems like a really easy choice, yeah. but like searching for stuff is so essential that like even if it was down 5%, I feel like I really want to do that to myself. <laughs> you know, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm trying to find that one, like... The red race condition for sequel alchemy. Uh -huh. to, like, 
I just don't want to like, it's already, I'm already frustrated a lot of times if I'm in that kind of scenario and I'm like, I really need the best answer, like the best answer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I've had a few of those uh, lately and, and yeah, it helps, you know, the Google algorithm is better for some of that stuff. This portion of Talk Python to Me is brought to you by Kite, the smart AI powered autocomplete for your editor. As developers, our choice of editor is central to our work. The more powerful and effective that that editor is, the more effective that you are. That's why I'm excited about Kite. Kite is a free plugin for your code editor that gives you ML powered auto completions and documentation. Chances are it works with your editor of choice. Even if that editor has existing autocomplete features, the list includes PyCharm, VS Code, Atom, Sublime, Vim, and more. And Kite runs locally, so your code is private with no cloud or internet connection necessary. And the Kite is 100% free, so try it today at talkpython.fm slash kite, K-I-T-E, and see how Kite can help you be more effective with your Python code. We talked about domain rank and those kinds of things. So... I went to moz.com and I clicked on free SEO tools and that yeah. comes up. It says, enter your domain and we'll tell you a couple of things. And then I also went yep. to a, a private incognito window and did a search. So one yeah. of the things that I am a little bit proud of, impressed with myself that I was able to do is that if you do a, it's super important that you're not logged in, right? Cause it totally could vary on your history. That's but right. At least where I am now at the time it is now, it's been here for a while. If I go to Google and I search for free MongoDB Python course, the number one result is free mongodbcourse.com, which is my course for my, like nice. it's a, a landing domain. Good job. That's an not entire easy. La- <laughs> and and uh, like number three is MongoDB's actual free courses, <laughs> right? Nice. Which are taught in Python. Nice. So I'm feeling really good about that. I put that into that domain. There's only one page there, right? So I think that hurts it a little bit, but if the search lines up just right, it's okay. So because it only has one page, it is like a page, basically. The domain authority is 22. Okay. Yeah, so that's kind of okay. Uh, I'm not sure what yeah. to think about that. but It's low, but it's, it's, it's okay. It's low, but it's like one niche thing, right? Yeah. It's ranking keywords are 36. I don't know what that is, but the spam score is only 2%, so that's pretty good. And then uh-huh. I threw a uh, talkpython.fm in there. And that's domain ranking of 49. Yes, that's very good. Yeah, that's awesome. And its spam score is 1% and it has 1.6 thousand ranking keywords. Sure, okay, yeah. So the ranking keywords is the, the stuff that search engines would use to figure out whether to list your website as a result or not. Theoretically, the more you have, the better. I see. It shows, also shows you cool things like here are the top ranking keywords, uh-huh. and it's I guess this is where it ranks if you were to search for this, like Python podcast, it's number one. Async techniques and examples in Python, it's number one. That's kind of cool. And then it has like more by number of clicks. So it has like 100 mm-hmm. days of code where we're not that high, but it's like there's a ton of search clicks for it. I feel like this actually gives me a lot of pretty interesting information if there's another tool in there about link research and you can pop your website in there and it tells you the things that link to you that's also important so uh, we were talking about your rank uh, what links to you matters because it helps your rank but the quality like the domain authority of the sites that are linking to you is a modifier on how much that link matters to your website right because there are aggregators so like i found that like I have a bunch of aggregators that link to me, but their domain authority is so low that they don't really affect, those links don't really affect my stuff. Yeah, so it's like multiplying by zero, right? These links are coming in, but they mean nothing because they're like so yeah. badly ranked. That's right. And interesting, we talked about like my domain rank for tracks that passes 33, but some of the pages in there have a different page authority. Like the microservices article of mine has the highest page rank of, Page authority of 52. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's interesting how all that plays a little bit. And so if you go to that tool that does some link research for you, it'll show you the number of links you have as well based by the domain authority of the linkers. And that brings me to something else we'll talk about later about how you do your A tags, your href tags in HTML and why that matters. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, I think there's some really some of these great tools out there that I think people just don't think to use. 
Like I used Moz a long time ago when I was setting up my training site to try to understand how I might make it rank better. But yeah. then I actually forgot about, I didn't forget about Moz, but I like it went off my radar and I stopped using it. Like I literally haven't been to Moz.com or whatever the URL is for like a year. Right. But I should be going there frequently and like looking at how things are evolving, what are new trends and how can I get involved with it? Like you know, what has some traction and what can I make it grow? Right. You got to be careful not to do it too often because all this stuff takes like weeks to propagate. It's like changing DNS servers or something, you know, it takes days. Well, this takes weeks. <laughs> Does it work weeks, now? So. Does it work now? Like, no, you yeah, really need to right. stop asking. It's just wait a while. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in, in terms of tools while we're on it, like the Moz one's great for getting domain ranks and, and links and stuff like that. But there is a Google search console as well. Have you yeah. used that one? I have used that one. And that is pretty good. You can say, show me some of the keywords. How do I rank against them? What are my That's popular right. keywords? And you can trust that even a little bit better because it literally is from Google, right? Google says, here's right. how we would rank you for this thing. Yeah. And the interesting part is you get like how often people have been clicking in search results to your domain. You get total number of times you've shown people your domain. Like I was looking at my stuff. I have like 2% average click-through ratio is what they call it. So my domain has been shown 240,000 times uh, in the last three months, I guess. And out of that, it's been clicked 4,800 times. And it gives me the average position that shows up on the Google search results. And the goal is, like you said earlier, to bump that into at least the top 10, right? And depending on what, and you can play with that to find which search keywords give the highest position. Like I have, if you look for distributing Python applications, I'm number four, according to the search console, right? But the domain just in general is on average of 20. Okay. It's a lot of little things. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there are. So let's see if I go here. Yeah. For, I got to have a, a range, I guess this is over the last couple months, search results, 18,688 total clicks. That's pretty cool. Yeah. The other one that's really interesting that I guess we should maybe talk about, this is like definitely on the developer side is, um, error pages, site maps, yes. that kind of stuff. Because the, the next graph that I see here is a graph that says, here's the coverage of our searching of your site. You have 3,573 valid pages, which might blow people's minds, but there's like, you know, all the courses and every lecture of the course has its own transcript landing page for SEO yep. somewhat and for usability. It's like there's a ton of pages and then it has the number of errors. Right now I have zero errors and 3,573 valid pages and it shows the growth of errors over time and pages over time. And I put a lot of work into making sure that my sitemap is like complete. How much do you think that matters? It's important. And they use the sitemap to figure out how to crawl. So not only is that important for your main page, say you have a staging page. I don't know how you do your stuff, but like I have like a staging version of Trag Set Pass where I try stuff out. You can configure stuff not just with the sitemap, but with with like robots.txt so they don't crawl those pages because you don't want those to show up and affect your search uh, results, especially because they're going to have errors and stuff like that. So as a developer, that's one of the things you got to worry about. I was working on a website for my company and application service a while back. And uh, that's uh, like, we had a staging version. I didn't know about any of this. And I'm like, oh man. So our domain, we had like staging dot our stuff and just the regular production version. I'm like, oh, maybe all this affected our page rank out uh, on the real internet, right? Yeah, it's basically, it might divide it by two, right? Because it's the same content. And so... That's right. So that brings me... It, might as well talk about it now. So so we've been talking about links. So having copies of your content counts against your rank. Right. It basically dilutes the value and then other things are able to get above it, right? Yeah. So essentially, they try to figure out whether you're plagiarizing your own content, like whether the <laughs> domains are plagiarizing it, essentially, right? Yeah. So if you have like the exact same article show up somewhere else that becomes like that whole page that whole article both yours and the other person's will have a lower ranking compared to yours and so that's why like if you go to sites like dev.2 and you publish something there you can link to your article to your original source and you you add an extra piece of information in the tag in the html tag that says this is a uh, canonical link so that means that the original source, you're pointing to the original source, and then the search engines won't count dev.2 
against your original article. And they're actually, they'll actually complement each other. Right. Okay. So I ran into something like that recently. I had the strangest problem, which I came up with an even stranger solution to. I spent days, days trying to solve this problem. If you went to talkpython.fm slash forward slash or training.talkpython.fm slash forward slash, I don't remember which of those two sites it was that had the problem. They are both on, they're both on Ubuntu 18. They're both running Nginx. They're both running the same type of certificate. They're basically identical servers. One of them in Safari, whether it was mobile, like this is actually where it matters a lot. It's like all of iOS. <laughs> You would go to one of them. It would say it was an error where like the site said it disconnected. Like the connection was reset was the error. You look at the logs and it was fine, right? I see. Yeah. But any other page on the site was fine. Like slash episodes was fine. Slash about was fine. Slash anything other than slash home was fine on one server. The other server was fine everywhere. I spent days trying to figure this out and figure out what the, like everything I could tell the two servers were set up the same. And I just finally said, you know what? If iOS is happy with slash anything, but the slash like by itself, I'm just going to redirect it to slash home and have slash home be like a copy of the homepage that is for anytime I detect Safari. I'm like, dude, we're just going to redirect you to like another URL that's deeper in the site, but it shows the same content because that one renders fine and not just the forward slash didn't work, right? So I was like, forget this. But what I didn't think about was the SEO impact of that, right? Because if Google comes and says, today I want to be Safari, let's see what's up. Like, oh, I'm over on this other page, which looks like the same content as Chrome saw yesterday on forward slash. One of the listeners said, you know, you have the same content. You really should use this rel equals canonical on yep. there. And so what I did to like stop undermining myself while still making <laughs> iPhones work was to just put like do a test. Like if it's slash home in the template, just put a meta tag that says or whatever kind of tag. It says rel canonical is the forward slash URL, not the forward slash home URL. That's right. Yep. But this can be used in other places. Like if you want to write on Medium, but also on your blog but have your blog get the SEO juice. I don't know if it works on Medium. It works in some places, like Dev2 and other places, right? Dev.2 has it like in their stuff to set it up. You have the capability of doing that. In Medium, I know you can add some HTML stuff in there, so it might. That's one of the reasons I got off of Medium a while back. Honestly, I'm not a fan of Medium. I think it's a beautiful site. It's a nice experience. But I, it just, yeah. it, there's just... The paywall killed it for me. Dude, there's just too many things that go against the grain. Like, I'm not even against a paywall. Somebody says, like, I want to do, like, deep writing and have people pay for that. That's great. Like, that's that's their work sure. and their choice. But I feel like Medium was built up on the back of this is a free place that people can do awesome writing. Let's all get together and then, like, yank on the rug and now it's paid, right? You know what I mean? It's like, I feel like they didn't build on that ethos. But, and so it's like a bait and switch, yeah, that's which what is I why like. I don't like it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's what killed it for me. And so, like, for me, that switched off of Medium, it was really hard. I mean, I still get people following me on the Medium article, right? And I'm like, <laughs> how do I, how do me, I bring that here. traffic to my website, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. So while we're on it, this is not exactly SEO, but it does talk about rank and keyword and relative stuff. And it's really good for exploring other sites. So have you played with similar web similarweb.com? No, I, I saw you added the, the link. And I pulled it up, but just barely looked at it. Yeah. So if you go in there, you just type in any domain, like you could type in like talkpython.fm or you could talk real Python or try paths.org, whatever you want. It'll come up with a ranking. It only has like tons of information for sites that are ranked well enough, but it will show you like traffic over time, month by month. Right. So right now it says I'm getting 56,000 unique visitors a month who spend an average of four minutes and visit 3.45, 3.42 pages, and so on during their visits. And this is not because it's plugged. I don't even show this up. This is not, yeah. Well, it's got to get to like a certain level, right? But yeah. But you could take any, like if you have a competitor or something you're trying to like, hey, we're building a site. We want it to rank. Here's some of our competition. And they're, they're ranking well. So you can put that in there and you can see like traffic by countries, traffic sources, the referrals, the places that are linking, like you talked to, linking into it. So apparently... GitHub, python.org, forums.fast.ai. All these are like strong linking, referring sites to mine. 
not because I know that, but because this external thing is like tracked it just. Yeah. Okay. Whether the traffic is paid. So this is a good one for like how, and then you could put another domain next to it and it'll put those charts next to each other and say, here's how you compare to that other place in general ranking traffic, types of traffic and whatnot. I could have sworn that some of this was also available in Moz. Um, if I find it, I'll, I'll, I'll give sure. you a link. This portion of Talk Python to Me is brought to you by Linode. Whether you're working on a personal project or managing your enterprise's infrastructure, Linode has the pricing, support, and scale that you need to take your project to the next level. With 11 data centers worldwide, including their newest data center in Sydney, Australia, enterprise-grade hardware, S3-compatible storage, and the next-generation network, Linode delivers the performance that you expect at a price that you don't. Get started on Linode today with a $20 credit and you get access to native SSD storage, a 40 gigabit network, industry-leading processors, their revamped cloud manager at cloud.linode.com, root access to your server, along with their newest API and a Python CLI. Just visit talkpython.fm slash Linode when creating a new Linode account and you'll automatically get $20 credit for your next project. Oh, and one last thing, they're hiring. Go to linode.com slash careers to find out more. Let them know that we sent you. That type of analysis is really, really interesting and, and useful. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, that helps determine how well your stuff is going to show up. So there's a, speaking of Moz, like they, they wrote a pretty interesting article called The Beginner's Guide to SEO, which you're linking to. We'll put it in the show notes. Yep. And we've heard of Maslow, Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You need shelter. And then you need like human contact, you know, then you need That's food right. or maybe you need food, then shelter, right? But whatever, like eventually way, way up there is like entertainment and fulfillment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. That's right. Yeah. So there's something like they put together like this for SEO and says like, you must have this to be ranked. And then like, you can be more competitive as you layer on more advanced stuff. Do you want to talk us through that? Yeah. Yeah. So we can go through the pyramid and some of these we'll dive into a little more detail in, in a little bit. So like right at the bottom, right, is uh, crawl accessibility. So that means that your website must be the search engine crawlers, the robots that go out and just scrape the internet and formulate the model or whatever to find search results. Um, your website needs to be crawlable, essentially. And that means you have to have good HTML and good things for, for those robots to actually be able to parse the information. Right. That's a little bit like what I was talking about with the sitemap and the number of That's error right. pages versus the number of discovered pages, right? But it also means like if you go to a part of your site is behind a login or a paywall or some other interaction, that is blind to the world, right? That is no longer part of the search index of the world. And so you exactly. just got to like, it might be fine. That might be your personal account info or whatever. Right? You don't want it to be. But sometimes I see people building sites in a way that I think, oh, you don't want to do that because Google's not going to get there. And that's a problem. Yeah, so that's, so that's why single page web apps are uh, an interesting, have an interesting situation when trying yes. to be searchable. So you'll find that a lot of, uh, like say, uh, just to pick something like say Linode or whatever, and, and, and I'm not saying that they are a single page web app, but you'll find that a lot of these companies that have consoles or something, that some, some application type of thing that's available through the website, um, they actually have a landing page. And then from the landing page, you can load up the, the web app. You can't have the whole thing be the web app or the stuff just won't start, won't show up on the search engines. It's behind JavaScript. Exactly. If you look at view source of like a Vue.js app, it's entirely un underwhelming and it always looks the same because the data is not loaded right. yet, right? That's right. And in fact, it might even, might even count against you, which is like the next ring in the, uh, in the pyramid is uh, uh, having compelling content the only thing that the search engine will find there is just JavaScript. So it's not yeah. going to know what any of that means or what the paragraphs are, what the information is, nothing. So Yeah, I'm wondering it. if these days, if like when Google sees that, they're like, you know what, we have to fire up Selenium and hit this page to like get the answer, right? They may look for Vue.js, Angular, the, the couple popular ones and say, we got to... Yeah, I'm sure they do. We got to do a little more. They probably do, but it can't be helping. Right. Like even if eventually it does figure it out, I just feel like these spa apps cannot be helping their SEO case. No, there is some stuff that's been built to help all of that. I haven't looked too much into it, but there are things to help that side of the world. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. So compelling content, that's important. 
It's yep. sometimes tricky to do. I suspect like images. Like if you try to tell the story with a picture instead of with words, that might actually hurt you a little bit in terms of SEO. But when you make that image tag, you can have enough information in the image tag, which also helps the rankings. Like in the for... title or the alt or something like that? The alts, yeah. Okay. Yep. So there's that. And then just like the size of the content, just general grammar stuff, how the paragraphs are broken up. How many, in fact, having content for multiple languages also counts for you. There's okay. all kinds of stuff like that. And if, and if you're doing like international stuff like that, where you have like multiple versions of your site, that's like a whole new, like I wanted to do that recently because I wanted to, you know, Spanish is actually my first language. So I wanted to write the site in Spanish and provide a Spanish <laughs> yeah. version of it. And I started to look into, wait, what about like the canonical stuff and like what's going to show up here? And it's like, there's all these rules. I was like, I don't have time to look at all this. <laughs> <laughs> it was but already going to be a lot of work to rewrite it in a second language. And now you've got to like re SEO it and like, not, yeah, that's right. not, not just redo the SEO, but you got to make sure you don't hurt yourself. Right. Because if it shows up right. in two languages, it could be worse than just having one. If that's right. It thinks that's like copied. Right. Yeah. When we're talking about this, you know, we're not just talking about like, do I have the right keywords, which is actually the next ring in the pyramid, you know, having, having the words that are, searchable that represent what the article is about right but we're talking about like just like html formatting right if you don't have the right tags in the right places with the right properties stuff doesn't get picked up correctly and i mean as a developer i mean it makes perfect sense if somebody wrote some code to go and crawl this website right and yeah. you know they're at google they're like well i'm gonna look for this if you don't put that in there oh well right <laughs> you want me to rank you well then put that in there <laughs> And exactly. Google's got like, got, they're all documented, all that stuff as you search around. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Next up, I guess, keyword optimize is out. Have, have we talked about that yet? Our- yeah, that's what we were just talking about. Yeah, okay. Then the, above that is the great user experience. Mm-hmm. Now we start getting a, a bit deeper into actual developer action. Yeah, and this is where the developer story starts to like really be your story around SEO. I mean, obviously you've got to have crawl accessibility, right? If, if your site crashes, if it's unreliable, if it doesn't generate the site map quickly or correctly, then all those things are right. Like you're not even yep. like alive on the hierarchy. You're at the bottom and you're not there, but here you have things like fast load speed and ease of use. And uh, the wording here is compelling UI on any device, but like uh, the developer word is like, um, a program, viewports. Not a program, yeah, like viewports and like responsive is the word I was looking for. Responsive UI that that like actually would look right on the device. That's right. Now you're well into the web developer, Python developer yeah. side of the story. And there is so much here, and we can talk, skip ahead a little bit around making your load times better. There's a bunch of tools. There's some. There's a website from Google called PageSpeed. Uh, which you can go and plug in a URL and it'll go do the, these rankings for you, these uh, checks for you. Yeah. And then there's a tool called Lighthouse, which runs on Chrome. So if you have Chrome developer tools, you can get it to actually launch and run it locally. And so what it does right. is it, it analyzes a website and you can ask it to do it, do an analysis, assuming you're running from a desktop or assuming you're running from a mobile phone with a fast speed or assuming you're running from a mobile phone with a slow connection, right? And I'll do all this analysis and you'll get into a bunch of things like uh, what format are your images? You know, are you PNG, are you JPEG and all that, right? And then it turns out that do they have the right compression ratios? How big are they relative to the page? Are you loading a 2000 pixel white image on a 400 pixel white page? You're just wasting people's time when you do that, right? Right, right. And when I logged into the Google search engine console that you talked about before, I got a big pop-up that said, mm-hmm. there's one of these domains I hadn't visited for a while. And uh, it said, your site has now been switched to mobile first indexing. That's right. That's right. And one of the considerations is, does this page render good? on a mobile phone. And they also think, when they think about performance, I think a lot of developers, they think, okay, and I I totally count myself among this group in the early days, and I'd like to hear your thoughts as well, is I go and I hit the server, how fast is the database? How fast is Pyramid, Flash, Django, whatever, getting out the door? Like how quick am I getting like first byte to user, basically? And then that's kind of like, I'm done. Like I've solved it. Like I've, now it's down to the browser to deal, right? Yeah, but that's just the beginning. Right. 
That's what you um, learn apparently when you you try to like start oh, doing this analysis. Yeah. Oh my right? goodness! Yeah, I did my stuff. My stuff is a static page, so like yeah. I was like, oh yeah, this is <laughs> awesome. It just loads the page. But it's gonna blaze. Yeah. There's nothing else to worry about. One millisecond. We're good. <laughs> I'm good. So what did you get when you first put it into the Page Speed Insights, which is like the hosted version of Lighthouse? Do you remember? Uh, I was probably like in the 60s. Yeah. Or something like that. And so so that has a ranking 0 to 100, right? Yeah, exactly. So 0 to 100. I put uh, training.talkpython.fm in there and then TalkPython and then Python Bytes and whatnot. And those sites are crazy fast in the way I described, like the database out the first byte out of you know the the server is really fast. It's like totally reasonable to have a page that's 10 milliseconds. And I'm like, well, how could it possibly be slow? So let's see what amazing numbers I get if I throw it in here. And I got like 50. And it says, which is on the bottom end of moderately slow. And I'm like, what, that's right. that, what is this? What is going on? And so I spent three days going through the recommendations, like three eight-hour days working on one of the sites. And now I've got it up to, if I go to training.talkpython.fm, on mobile, I get 94, and on desktop, I get 100. Cool. Yeah, nice. I'm, I'm in the and 90s as well now, yeah, finally. Yeah, and it, there's flexibility, right? Like, if the server hasn't requested a page, it might be a slightly... There's, like, there's some variability here, and it's, even if you just rerun yeah. it. But what's interesting is the 94 is the, the mobile version. Like, how fast can... If you've got an image that has to be resized, it's one thing to do it on a high-end desktop. But if the phone has to resize it that's going to hurt your ranking because it's like computationally slow for the phone to render the page. And there's all these different layers of stuff that you've got to look at. I mean, if you just loaded the image itself the wrong size, it's bigger. So you just, you just sent the phone extra data that it's not really needed, right? Yeah. So to stick with it, so there's a few pieces here to stick with the images. So the first thing that I, the Google stuff recommends is to use WebP as the yeah. format, not PNG, not JPEG as a compression format for your images. And that's great. It works great. It's, you know, it's usually lower image sizes, which is why they recommend it. It's Google's proprietary <laughs> image format, right? That's right. Of course they're going to recommend it. So I was like, I did all this. I'm like, I got my stuff into the 90s. We'll get to the rest of it in a minute. I'm like talking to uh, a buddy at work that also runs some websites and stuff. And he pulls out his iPhone and goes to my website. He's like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what's up with your images? I'm like, what do you mean? Safari doesn't render WebP because oh, Apple, right? Yeah. So that leads to you, in order to do this correctly, you can no longer use the image tag. You have to use the picture tag. There's a picture tag? This is like totally changing my, like blowing my mind. Yes. And the picture tag has fallbacks. So okay. I'm trying to find the good one I have on my site. But essentially, you can specify a list of images and you say... If the screen size is of this many pixels, load this image. If it's of this many pixels, load this image. If the, you know, whatever. And then in the end, if you can't load any of those, load this image. So right. I had like, so for every image in my website, and that's important for me. So in Tracks at Pass, we do illustrations and they come on. Like, I'm like, I want to load, you know, the 4,000 pixel illustration because it's really nice, right? Yeah, but obviously yeah. I can't. So I have four different files for every image. Each one optimized, you know, there's like a one at like, a, I think it's 1280 pixels. I do one in the 800s and one in the 400s. And then right. I automatically pick which one to use with the picture tag. And then I also have a PNG format for the people that, that are using Safari to render it. Yeah, that sounds really tricky, right? Because now you've got to have all these different types. And then how do you know about like the 404 missing image? Because you viewed it on a device that supports that. It, it selected a That's different right. format and whatnot. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't gone Do down you... that path on the... I'm just going to export it as JPEG with a slightly lower quality and make sure the sizes... Like, I might have multiple sizes that are all JPEG or, like, one's PNG and a bunch are smaller. Sure. But I don't know. Like, the the varied support, it just it threw me off. I'm just like, I just don't know that I want to go down this path of having, like, unsupported image types that I've got to swap out and take care of. Yeah, that was an interesting adventure for me. Continuing down that, you get the screen optimizations and the fallbacks with the picture tag. Yep. But outside of images, right, these days, people use CDNs a lot to load things that run on their website. So I have de delivered a static web page and I need jQuery to do something. I go link to some CDN that has jQuery. Well, that's yet another connection that client's browser needs to open. And that connection is going to open to a different server, which means... You guys know how this works, right? <laughs> if I went to trackset 
I did a DNS query to figure out what IP address it was, open a TCP connection, download some data. If I'm talking about JavaScript, I'm I'm then parsing that and loading it up, right? Right. Well, now if I I have a, an extra script tag in there, now I have to do that same thing for whatever DNS is providing, whatever domain is providing that. So if that's coming from... Uh, you know, Google Fonts, right? So that's, we got to do the DNS query, open up Google Fonts, download the font, do whatever parsing, and show it in the website. So for every CSS or script or external thing that loads into your page, you're doing all of these things. And that has an impact. And that actually shows up. And it counts against you regardless of whether it's a CDN link, a second link yeah. on your site, or what, like it's just number of connections we got to do, the more the worse. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's more work for the client for the browser, right? Yeah. So, so in order to help that around, there's a number of things that you can do in your header, in your HTML that okay. will serve as uh, preloads. So there's a couple different commands. There's uh, the link tag, like you would add a style sheet or whatnot, but there's also, there's a rel property that you can set to preload or pre-connect. And pre-connect means do the domain name resolution. So that means you do that once because ahead of time, like for example, the Google Analytics that get added to my website, I do a pre-connect to Google Analytics so that that, all of that is resolved. The TCP connection is already open at the start of the page. And by the the time it makes it all the way to the bottom and actually needs to load something, it just needs to go and, and get data versus having to do. Right. It's probably done the DNS resolve and actually already done the SSL exchange that's and right. The, the the port opening to the server, even maybe, uh, they're That's just right. waiting to issue the HTTP GET. Yep. Yeah. And for that one, I needed to pre-connect because the GET changes slightly. I'm looking at dumping the whole Google Analytics stuff. So at some point, that that's a different conversation we should also have. <laughs> I've since dumped them. So yeah, I hear you. There's also a preload command you can give out, which actually essentially just loads the file that you say. It just loads it and keeps it in memory. It doesn't use it immediately. It's just there. And then when you run into it at, in the rest of the document, then it uses it. So I use that for like the fonts. The fonts get preloaded and some JavaScript gets preloaded and stuff like that. Yeah. I just recently saw my first page that was like full of these preloads and preconnects. And I'm like, oh, this is a thing that I didn't know about. How interesting. And it, it's clearly like, we're going to set this up and fire these off. And like, as soon as you can get them, as soon as you got a break and loading stuff, go get these. And yeah, that seems, seems pretty cool. You know, another one that's will probably basically not help you on page speed on on the Google page speed site but will really make your users happy is just browser caching. Yes, and there's different aspects of that and different problems that it generates. You can give the browser instructions on what to cache and how long to cache it for. Yeah. And the page speed stuff actually takes that into consideration for how long you're caching things. Yeah. I actually took advantage so I have like a, a set default kind of thing. But I also took advantage of using, I use Cloudflare in front of the website. So I can dynamically change that in Cloudflare depending on what it is. So I can, I can add like rules that say, well, tell our clients to cache the images for a year, right? Because I'm not going to change the image for an article, but right. only cache the HTML for a week or okay. something like that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, on mine, I have it. Every CSS, JavaScript, image, everything is cached, I think, for a year. Yeah. And they recommend a really high number. Yeah, and it's really good in terms like speed. Like I was at a hotel in Israel and trying to get back to some sites. So they were all just dragging. And mine is like zip, 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 because it just exchanges just the HTML and nothing else, right? One connection, everything else is out of the browser. I'm like, this is really super cool. It's working well. The problem is, If you change anything, like you update your style, then it's all busted, right? That's where question mark and some hash comes into play. I have a whole infrastructure that says, here's the URL and on the server side, generate a hash, like Uh cache ID equals whatever the hash is. And if that file changes, it's going to rehash it. So it's an entirely different thing that's cached again for a year. Like it might use up another 200K of somebody's browser cache, but who cares, right? It's memory's cheap. Yeah, sure. So... On that, right, there's, aside from the caching, right, don't forget that any JavaScript or CSS that you give out to your customers, you want that to be minimized, right? And that yes. means, what, is, yes. what does minimization mean? That means 
removes all of the spaces, for example. Yeah. You also want fewification, which is a bundle. That's right. right. You want, want less of them and you want them to be smaller, taken as an aggregate. That's right. And so then like there are minimizers. Google has a, a tool that you can use for minimizing CSS and JavaScript. And it's not just removing spaces, but it also, like in the case of JavaScript, it'll rename all your variables. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it does a little bit of obfuscation, right? So if you have a, like, as a developer, you want to have descriptive variables, but the tools will actually take that variable name down to one letter as much as you can. Okay. So you'll find your users.username, users.email, whatever, can turn into A.B, A.C. Right, right, right. Yeah, which can, can be significant. Yeah, for the right app. Just the whole point of that is to reduce the size of the file that you're transferring to right. the clients. Right. right. You want to reduce the size, and if you can, you want to bundle them. That doesn't always work because sometimes, like, the JavaScript might refer to a relative path back to, like, a, like an image or a CSS file or something. And then, like, if you yeah. bundle them up up the directory, then they get all broken. I had something like that with Font Awesome. I had to stop. I'd, like, unbundle mm-hmm. Font Awesome or something because it was couldn't find pieces of itself there's some tricky stuff as it refers between files yes but theoretically which is contrary to usual programming practices <laughs> the more that you can put all of this stuff in the one file right so if yeah. you can combine so there's a the tools will do that for you too if you load jquery and font awesome and you know bootstrap and a bunch of javascript and then the javascript for your website you can run it for these tools and it'll put everything into one file and then minimize it. Yeah. And so then you're transferring one thing, which means one TCP connection, one request, and you're just moving data back. Well, and say one thing that I came across and started using exactly in this space when I was going down the lighthouse thing is it said, you're making 26 requests for JavaScript and CSS. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm done. Like I, there's nothing <laughs> I can do to like, how can I fix this? Right. And I knew about bundling, but I'm like, this is going to be a lot of trouble. Cause I, I like to have small CSS files. Like this part of the site has its own CSS file, so it's not huge and I, I can reasonably deal with it, right? But but Google was hating on it because it's like, here's another request. I'm like, yeah, but it's cached for a year, but like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> My page rank is what they say, and it's the first request, not the cached request. So whatever. Yep. Along those lines, there's uh, progressive web apps, Yeah. if folks have heard about that. So a uh, try except pass is a PWA, progressive web app. I think that's, I might disable that, but what that does is it makes your, you can write a little bit of JavaScript that will make your website run even when your site is not online Mm -hmm. as much as possible. And it can be executed, like if you have a Chromebook or an Android phone or an iPhone, you can actually make a shortcut to the site. So you'll have like an icon just for your site. You can just click it and, and it'll come online. And all that JavaScript does is it registers what they call a worker and the every request that the web page makes for content goes through this worker mm. essentially and the worker you can do whatever you want with it but the main point is the worker keeps a local cache and the worker knows what to pre-cache so when your website oh, comes online it says load all these images for you and then for every request lo- go get them and load it into a cache that gets stored in local storage in your web pages you can see it all in developer tools and so then, you know, that makes your website run fast and you can even have an off, you have to have an offline page. So if you need to like fetch the content and you can't get to it, you can provide the users and like, oh, I can't get to the internet right now. This is what it looks like. Okay. Yeah. That's really cool. What I came across was this thing called web assets, all one word. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a Python library that does that bundling and minification you're talking about. It uses JS min and CSS min, which are Python packages that mm. do that for JS and you know, JavaScript and CSS. And so now when my site starts, it just does like a quick check. Hey, do I need to rebuild the one giant CSS and JavaScript files? So I don't have to remember to take it and like, oh, I forgot to run that. So that's out of date. Like, it's just like at the start, it goes, here's the hash of the files. Is there anything new? Let's regenerate them. And it's kind of just all automatic, right? So that's a pretty good set of Python tools. Nice. Yeah. I'll I knew about this at work. I actually hadn't thought about looking at that for the stuff I have at home for some reason. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to go I'll have to go see it might help me out with a few things. I have a really quick one that'll totally help uh-huh. people. This one only works on Mac OS. Okay. But I think they link to other options on their site. An image optim. I am A J like image O P T I M. Okay. And what it is is like a, a just a, a collection of algorithms that do lossless. 
recompression and re-encoding of images. Okay. Right. So like you visually, literally there's no visual change to what's happening, but it might re-encode it. Like it might change the color spectrum for a PNG because it realizes only 256 colors. Oh, that's pretty cool. Right. And so what you can do is you can take just the root of your website and throw it at this. It will traverse the directories, find all the things and in place, replace them with their optimized but unchanged version. Nice. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I did this on uh, my sites, and I got like 40% less. It went from like 20 megs nice. of images to, I don't know, whatever that was, like nine. And you just nice. it takes forever, but you just literally drag, drop, wait, done. Cool, I'll, I'll check it out, yeah. So I was going to say on the image side, I use, I was talking about WebP earlier, I forgot to mention it, I use CWebP, which is, you can just okay. go install it, and uh, it'll produce WebP images, and you can have it resize the images for you. You feed it like a JPEG and PNG, and it out, it, it'll put out um, of that kind? Yeah, and you can define what quality you want, and what size you want for the image, so it'll even resize it automatically for you. Cool. Yeah, those are, I like those because they're so easy, like they, they take no work, and they're like, as long as you got your stuff in GitHub, checked in, source control, like you're not in real danger of messing up stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Chris, we're getting kind of closer to the end of the show, running short on time. I feel like we've just scratched the surface though, you know? Yeah. What else, uh, like quickly, what else should we like point out for folks that they should go check out? We can talk about a few pieces. So in Google search, so, okay. Trying to figure out which one works best. So you put a link in Twitter, Twitter pulls up like a little card with uh, an image and a little summary of the website or whatever it is that you link. Right. For the cool sites, it does, right? Yeah, they're right. Like ours, right? Exactly. So all that is configured through meta tags. And there's actually a standard, there's a Twitter. It seems like Twitter came first and, or maybe just Twitter was different. Everyone else seemed to grab it or whatever, right? Yeah. There's a, I think it's called Open Graph that describes a set of meta tags you can put into your website to provide a title, a description, a summary, what image you want to use for that little uh, summary, a bunch of stuff like that. And keywords as well, which is also important. So all those meta tags you have to put in there because not just it works for Twitter, but it works for your search engine and as part of the of the rankings. Yeah, that's awesome. And it definitely helps your stuff look more professional when anybody happens to grab it and that's share right. it on social, right? It's, it's got this cool visual, like you've structured how it looks rather than just depending on like, a weird truncated URL. Yeah, exactly. And along the same lines, there's actually a whole other standard called JSON-LD, okay. which is used to essentially provide a JSON version of the stuff in your website, in your page. Hmm. So, for example, when you go to Tricep Pass, in the main index, I can say, uh, I am a website of articles. And here are all the articles and the titles and links and all that stuff. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's parsed by search engines, but not just that. That information is actually used to generate the little cards that show up in the Google searches. You know, if you search for a recipe, it'll sometimes have the little... And all of that stuff has higher priority than the rest of the content because it shows up up top in your your search results, right? And that is actually used if you go to the Google Search Console... There's a little discovery section on the left side, which is part of like if you're on an Android device and it's one of the Google built-in things in there and it shows content that Google thinks you'd be interested in. If you have these things available, then it shows up in discovery a little bit more. Oh, cool. You can characterize your website with it. You can say it's articles, it's recipes, it's video or whatever. There's, There's like all this stuff to help do that. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so that's JSON LD, huh? That was a piece that's important. JSON LD. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes as well so people can have that. Oh yep. man. So many things. It's so awesome. And the thing is it's rewarding if you get this right, you know, people just engage with you and your content more or your products or whatever. And it's awesome. Yep. Exactly. All right, Chris. We'll cool. have to leave it here. But uh yep. you know, maybe it'll have to be a, a second edition to like dive deeper into this. <laughs> but before you get out of here, you gotta answer the two questions again. Uh you write some Python code. What editor do you use? I'm on VS Code these days, loving the uh remote extension. Oh yeah, that's super cool. I yep. I wanted to start using that as well some more. I probably will. I was talking about redoing my servers. Maybe it's the time to get like a little hook for that in there as well. Yep, and then yep. uh, Notable PyPI package. I'm using Unsync these days a little bit. I know you like that one. I'm all about Unsync. I love that. It's like awesomeness per line of Python code. Can't be beat. Yep. It's a really nice one. Awesome. Yeah. So basically, it's a unifying API across 
uh, threaded parallelism, multiprocessing parallelism, and async I/O. Yep. And a slightly better API for all of them, right? And one. Yeah, exactly. It's so yeah. so clean. It's really yeah, nice. I, I love really it. simple. Great recommendation. Yeah. All right. Yep. Final call to action. People want to like they've got their site. Maybe they just threw it into uh, page speed, and they're like, "How could it be 54? This is un- I can't believe it's 54." <laughs> or, or you know, they saw something crazy in the. Search Console, they want to take some action, make this better, get their stuff to rank better. What do they do? If you're using PageSpeed, just uh, take advantage of the actual output. It's really descriptive. There's links to all the documentation and why all of the things matter. Just like take your time and go through it and start optimizing. Uh, You'll probably be able to get a bunch out of just optimizing images first. So you can prioritize stuff like that. Then you can head over to the JavaScript stuff. And then you can start looking at the connections and whatnot. I think reading through the Moss guide, that which is a long guide, we'll link in the show notes, is very useful. Remember, producing a good website not only it makes more people come to it, though you know people will be happier with it. It'll seem responsive and and uh, more professional, right? I agree. Yeah, all these things help SEO, but most of them also help the users directly. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Happy users is a good thing. <laughs> that's for sure. All right. Well, Chris, it's been great to have you back on the show. Until next time. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Bye-bye. Catch you later. Bye. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Our guest on this episode was Chris Medina, and it's been brought to you by Kite and Linode. Kite is the smart AI-powered autocomplete for your editor, and the more powerful your editor is, the more effective that you are. Get Kite for free at talkpython.fm slash kite. Start your next Python project on Linode's state-of-the-art cloud service. Just visit talkpython.fm slash Linode, L-I-N-O-D-E. You'll automatically get a $20 credit when you create a new account. Want to level up your Python? If you're just getting started, try my Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps course. Or if you're looking for something more advanced, check out our new async course that digs into all the different types of async programming you can do in Python. And of course, if you're interested in more than one of these, be sure to check out our Everything Bundle. It's like a subscription that never expires. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes feed at slash iTunes, the Google Play feed at slash play, and the direct RSS feed at slash RSS on talkpython.fm. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Now get out there and write some Python code.